thank you everyone that's come to watch me today uh, in person and, and virtually. Uh, it's a real honor to be here. So today I'm really excited to share with you what we've been doing to develop a modern height datum for modern positioning technology. But before I get too stuck into that, I wanted to share a thought that occurred to me whilst I was putting this talk together. So over the course of the last year, uh, as a newish dad with a one-year-old at home, I've had the pleasure of becoming re-familiar with some classic nursery rhymes. Yeah. <laughs> but the one about Jack and Jill has suddenly started to sound a, a bit weird. So it goes, Jack and Jill went up the hill to fetch a pail of water. That seems like kind of an odd thing to do, doesn't it? <laughs> so water normally flows downhill and pools and flows through valleys. Now, specifying whether places are up or downhill is really a matter of perspective. Heights on their own are a relative measurement, and the height of things changes depending on where you're standing. So, for example, the second floor of the building might be above us now, but if we were up on the third floor, it would be below us. So, a vertical datum is the glue between these different perspectives and lets us talk about heights in an absolute sense by defining the points where we're measuring our heights from. And an accurate vertical datum is a really important component when you're making a map of heights. And if you get it wrong, uh, it can look like weird things are happening, like water flowing uphill or pooling in unexpected places. So maybe Jack and Jill live somewhere where the vertical datum has a bit of an error. <laughs> the current official vertical datum in use in Australia is the Australian Height Datum, or AHD, and it's 50 years old this year. It's stood the test of time well, but it has some bumps and wrinkles, and it was never intended to be compatible with modern positioning technology like GPS. Today, uh, I'll, I'll be talking about what we've been doing to develop a new alternative vertical datum, which is a bit more accurate than AHD and a lot more compatible with GPS. So, my name's Jack McCubbin. I'm a geodetic scientist in the Australian Geospatial Reference Team in the National Geodesy section. I'm originally from the UK and studied maths at the University of Exeter. And in 2013, I set off on a bit of an adventure to study for a PhD in geophysics at Victoria University of Wellington in New Zealand. So my PhD project involved collecting a, a nationwide set of airborne gravity data and using it to compute a surface called the geoid, which is used to get meaningful heights from GPS data. Following this, I worked as a postdoc at Curtin University in WA, uh, computing a, ge a new geoid model for Australia. And in 2017, I came to work at GA as a geodetic gravity officer. So with three big moves under our belts, my wife and I are really happy to have settled here in Canberra. One thing that we really love about living here is that there's so much green space around, and we, we really take the opportunity to enjoy it as often as we can. We particularly like all of the great vantage points that are dotted around and love spending Saturday mornings hiking up to the top. So to name just three, we have Red Hill, which is about 734 meters high, Mount Ainsley at 842 meters, and Mount Madura at 887 meters. So these are all lovely spots, but as a geologist, when I see a sign with a height on it, I can't help but ask questions like, is this height physically meaningful, or 887 meters above what? And how is this height measured? <laughs> Much to my wife's annoyance. So what makes a height physically meaningful? Well, they're directly related to the amount of energy needed to overcome the tug of the Earth's gravity. It takes some energy to walk uphill because we have to work against the force of gravity and we can actually calculate how much. So for example, moving 100 kilograms up 887 meters to the top of Mount Majura requires around 870 kilojoules. This isn't nutritional advice, but that's about the same amount of energy in a small hot dog. <laughs> uh, in the same way, uh, physically meaningful heights also predict how water will flow. Water moves to the smallest possible potential energy level in the Earth's gravity field as it flows, which is the same place um, with the smallest physically meaningful height. 
the potential energy is larger at the top of the hill than at the bottom, so water has a tendency to flow from the top to the bottom. So for this reason, physically meaningful heights are useful for a number of industrial and research applications in fields like civil engineering and hydrology. The next question I had was 887 meters above what? So to be able to say whether Mount Majura is taller than Red Hill, the heights need to be referenced to a common surface, a, a place where heights are zero everywhere, which I've depicted by the cross hatching here. If you're able to walk over the surface, you would never feel like you were going up or downhill. It should be perfectly flat and level in relation to the Earth's gravity field. There are infinitely many of these surfaces, one on top of the other, uh, but one of them aligns best with mean sea level, and we call it the geoid. In a way, you can kind of think of the geoid as a model of where sea level should be on shore. The geoid, or some approximation to it, is normally the surface that's being referenced when you see a sign with X meters above sea level on it. So the final question I had was, how are these heights measured? Measuring physically meaningful heights is really difficult, and it's traditionally been the work of highly skilled professional surveyors. I've got a picture of one on the, there on the left. <laughs> Thanks, Nick. <laughs> uh, in, in the past, the only way to measure these heights accurately was to use leveling techniques. With these methods, the, the height of a point is determined by measuring the change in height incrementally over small distances. At each point, measuring along a flat, level surface which is aligned with the geoid and this kind of keeps track of where the reference level is. These heights are ultimately referenced to a physical place with a known height and here I've tried to depict it as a sea level which is commonly taken to be zero. Today leveling still remains to be the most accurate way to transfer physically meaningful heights but as you can see it's a, a lot of work to transfer heights over long distances. To cut down on some of this work, uh, physical benchmarks are often placed on the ground, which have a recorded height on them, so that surveyors don't always have to start at zero. And you may have seen these on the side of the road, but here's an example of one. So 50 years ago this year, uh, a series of these benchmarks were established over the whole of Australia, and it was a huge undertaking. First, mean sea level was observed at 30 tide gauges between 1966 and 1968, shown here, wrapping around the coast in the picture on the left. And the, the 30 measurements of mean sea level were then used as reference points for an interconnected web of nearly 100,000 kilometers of leveling, typically along major roads spanning the entire country. And in 1971, height differences at major junction points of the levelling sections were then combined together, and this resulted in the first and only realisation of the Australian height datum. Australian height datum heights were provided at these benchmarks, and these heights became fixed in law, permanently, for forever. If you want a new AHD uh, height somewhere, you can start levelling from one of these permanent benchmarks. The problem is that nothing is truly permanent. The ground can move slowly over time, so fixing a height at some point on the ground 50 years ago could be quite different to where it is today. And since the 1970s, many of the original AHD benchmarks have been disturbed or even destroyed, which can make connecting leveling data to AHD hard work in places. Some efforts have been made to preserve AHD heights at junction points, shown here by adding reinforcements to new marks, but for reasons I'll discuss shortly, the original heights can't really be reobserved or replicated. So at 50 years old this year, the datum and its infrastructure is really beginning to show its age. Fortunately, nowadays leveling is not the only way to determine heights. We're not completely reliant on this old degrading infrastructure anymore and we don't have to worry about finding a physical benchmark to reference our heights to. Almost everyone has a GPS-capable device in their pocket that can tell them where they are at any time. GPS technology became widespread in the 1980s and 90s, and as the technology has matured, the accuracy of the positions has improved significantly. 
And very soon, thanks to the Positioning Australia program, GPS accuracy in Australia will be improved to around three centimetres in areas with mobile phone coverage and 10 centimetres everywhere else. But for determining physically meaningful heights, this is only really half the story. GPS positions are often given relative to an ellipsoid, which is a nice, easy to define, smooth and flat geometrical shape. And I've drawn one in here in blue. But these positions are not completely related to the Earth's gravity field. Because of this, if we ask questions like, are GPS heights physically meaningful? Or can they be used to predict how water will flow? Then the answer is no. In fact, in relation to the Earth's gravity field and how we experience the world around us, the ellipsoid's not smooth and flat at all. It's strange to think about, but if you were able to walk over the surface of the, the, this ellipsoid, you would actually feel like you were going up and downhill. Gravity is not the same everywhere. We, we don't see it every day, but a flat surface in relation to the Earth's gravity field, like the geoid, has some bumps and wiggles. And these bumps and wiggles, which are kind of exaggerated here, this is what the geoid would look like from space. Relative to an ellipsoid, these ups and downs can be bigger than 100 meters. To get physically meaningful heights from GPS and position Australia in a physically meaningful sense, we need a model of where the geoid sits in space, or at least where it sits relative to an ellipsoid used for GPS positions. So a model of these end values shown here. So geoid models are determined from measurements of the subtle changes in the strength of gravity. And they really come in two flavors. Global models, mostly determined from satellite data, and regional models. Regional models typically start life as a global model, and then extra gravity measurements are added in that are generally only available locally to create a local or regional model which is more accurate. There have been a number of these models released over Australia since the 1960s, but the oldest model that we still support at GA is AusGeo 98. Please excuse these grainy pictures, I've had to dig through the archives a little bit to find them. So for AusGeo 98, the global model used as the basis was Earth Gravity module, uh, model EGM 96, and this was enhanced regionally over Australia mostly using data from the 1996 release of the National Gravity Database and some satellite and shipborne gravity data offshore. At the time, the database contained upwards of 700,000 individual gravity measurements, and these data points are shown in the center. The separation between the geoid and the ellipsoid is shown in the picture on the far right in meters. And over Australia, the, the difference between the ellipsoid and the geoid is between minus 40 and 80 metres. So these geometric wibbles and wobbles in terms of what's flat and level uh, have a, a pretty big range over Australia. Now, when AusGeoid 98 was put together, the idea was that you should be able to use the model with GPS data and get a height that matched up very closely with the Australian height datum heights. So the heights that were determined by leveling in the 70s that I mentioned a few moments ago. But something a bit funny happened when the AHD heights on benchmarks were compared to heights determined using GPS and the AusGeoid 98 model. In principle, they should be almost the same. But when they're compared, the differences between the two, shown on the right there, have, this, uh, have a range of around one meter and this weird overall north-south trend. Now, this was pretty unexpected, but thanks to research that's largely come out of Curtin University, these differences have been shown to be caused by the way that AHD was put together. So what went wrong? Well, from a glass of water to Lake Burley Griffin on a still day, the surface of small bodies of water lie almost perfectly flat in relation to the Earth's gravity field. But when we scale things up to the size of an ocean, other factors come into play. Over vast areas, there are changes in salinity and temperature and other factors which cause the sea surface to deviate from a perfectly flat um, and level surface. These departures of the sea surface from the geoid uh, is called mean dynamic topography. And here's a, a map of these departures across the whole globe. 
Australia covers a distance of over 3,000 kilometers from north to south, and the ocean temperature and salinity varies considerably over this enormous distance. And this causes the sea surface to deviate from a flat and level surface with variations of up to a meter. And this is really what the picture here shows. Uh, notice that over Australia, it's larger in the north than it is in the south. So, as I mentioned earlier, the Australian height datum level heights were referenced to mean sea level at 30 tide gauges dotted around the coast of the mainland. So, for this reason, the mean dynamic topographies kind of become embedded within them. Effectively, there's a, a one meter north-south tilt in AHD heights due to this mean dynamic topography. And it's important to note that this is completely unrelated to what's flat and level in relation to the Earth's gravity field. Um, and you can't really propagate it on shore in any meaningful sense. So how did this go unnoticed? Well, all of the original 1971 AHD heights were determined using leveling methods. And leveling involves measuring the change in height incrementally over small distances and adding all those changes up. The trouble is, there's no such thing as a perfect measurement. You always have some kind of error. And small errors in the height differences over the vast network of leveling runs, shown as the lines in the, the figure here, eventually add up and accumulate. The tolerance for the vast majority of AHD leveling heights was known as third order, or 12 root K. And this means that surveyors allowed up to 12 millimeters of error to accumulate over distances covering one kilometer, 12 centimeters over distances covering uh, 100 kilometers, or more than 65 centimeters over distances of 3,000 kilometers, so from the north to the south of Australia. So this is probably why the, the one meter-ish north-south tilt in the datum went undetected, because it was largely within the error bars of that network adjustment. So what's the impact? Well, to start, AHD heights can be uh, up to 50 centimeters different to heights above the geoid, which actually predict how water will flow. If you were to use AHD heights for large-scale modeling, this could cause rivers to flow in the wrong direction or water to pool in unexpected places. To get reliable results, you'd have to budget in some error to make up for the fact that you're using AHD heights. But also, if you're able to measure leveling heights perfectly, they would reference the surface parallel to the geoid, shown by the dotted lines. If you started leveling from two different benchmarks and met at a point in the middle, you could well end up with two different AHD heights for the same point, so H1 and H2 in the picture here. So for this reason, the benchmark AHD heights are not really internally consistent. So what does this all mean? Well, AHD heights have some error due to mean dynamic topography and local distortions embedded in the original leveling network adjustment. Uh, a surface where AHD heights are zero is not perfectly flat and level. If you're able to walk over the surface where AHD heights are zero, you would feel like you were going up and downhill by up to a meter. So to come back to one of the core questions, uh, AHD heights can't be used to predict how water will flow precisely. But despite all these problems with them, AHD heights are enshrined in law, and land surveyors require them to do their job. So in 2017, we computed OSGEOID 2020, which is a model that approximates where AHD heights are zero. And this model can be used to approximately transform heights that you get from GPS into AHD heights. So the model was calculated in two stages. First, we calculated a model of the actual geoid using gravity data. And we called this model the Australian Gravimetric Quasi-Geoid 2017, or AGQG 2017 which I've shown on the left here. Then we gridded up the difference between AHD heights and heights determined from GPS and the OSGEOID 2017 model at around 7,000 uh, points. And this produced a, a second layer that we then added to the GEOID model. This second layer, which is shown on the right here, is basically used to deform the actual GEOID model, so AGQG 2017, to fit a surface where AHD heights are zero. So it captures the wrinkles and the bumps and the north-south tilt 
in the 50-year-old Australian height datum that shouldn't really be there. And in the gaps in between the levelling benchmarks, we have essentially had to have a really good guess at where AHD is zero using interpolation. The final OSGEOID 2020 model is shown here on the right. The actual geoid model from the first step is seamless on and offshore, but when we include the AHD data, it has to be clipped to the coastline. And this is because AHD isn't defined offshore. We don't have a model of mean dynamic topography from 1971, and it wouldn't really be a useful thing to do anyway. So what we've actually done here is produce a reference surface for users of modern positioning equipment like GPS to compute heights that agree with the 50-year-old Australian height datum, heights uh, which are only really defined at a handful of benchmarks, where really AHD heights should on only be established using leveling methods and actually correspond to where things might have been 50 years ago relative to a, a bit of a wobbly approximation of sea level. So with this criti uh, critique in mind, in 2008, we conducted a user requirement survey to investigate how the Australian height datum and our OSGEOID 2020 model aligned with our users' needs. In total, we had 170 responses with respondents across industry and government. And the last similar study on user requirements for physical heights in Australia was conducted in 1988, which really predates the widespread use of GPS. So our survey was quite timely. So just to summarize two key results, we asked which method they used to establish physical heights. And 29% of respondents said that they used traditional leveling methods. But somewhat to our surprise, more than 50% of these people relied at least in part on GNSS and a geoid model. So these geoid models are very much out there and being used. We also asked what their accuracy requirements generally are. And 75% of the respondents need heights that have an accuracy uh, better than five centimeters. So OSGEOI 2020 was put together to replace an older but similar model, OSGEOI 09. And the special thing about the OSGEOI 2020 calculation is that we also tracked how the errors in the data propagated during all of the calculations. So this produced a companion map of uncertainty estimates, which shows how accurate the modeling is and what kind of height accuracies GPS users can expect when using the model in different places. What we can see here uh, is the uncertainty estimates for the AGQG 2017 model on the, uh, well, the, the actual model of the geoid on the left, and the uncertainty estimates for the OSGEOID 2020 which sort of simulates where uh, the AHD reference level uh, on the right. What we found was that OSGEOI 2020 is only accurate to around eight to 13 centimeters. And this is mostly because we can only really guess where AHD is zero at places other than directly on top of a benchmark. So a model with eight to 13 centimeters is really the best we can hope to do. And this is a, a pretty big limiting factor given, given that users need heights accurate to five centimeters. On the other hand, not only is AGQG 2017, uh, the geoid model, the better reference surface for physical heights, free from all of the errors in the 1971 realization of AHD, but the er er error analysis showed that we can model it much more accurately than we can ever hope to model the surface where AHD heights are zero. Generally, the AGQG 2017 model is accurate to just around four to eight centimeters. So surveyors are the main GPS users that need to be able to specifically determine AHD heights. But today, they only make up a small fraction of the GPS or GNSS user market. What we're looking at here is the percentage of GNSS or GPS chipset sales to different industries only 4.5% of these sales are to surveyors. By only releasing or supporting the OSGEOI 2020 model, we force everybody to use wibbly-wobbly AHD heights. But the vast majority, around 95% of other GPS users, are not wed to the 50-year-old Australian height datum. These users don't necessarily need 
uh, legally recognized heights. So we have the opportunity to provide them something better, heights above an actual geoid model, which are more closely aligned with the need for five centimeter or better accuracy. So this is exactly what we've addressed by releasing the Australian Vertical Working Surface, or AVWS. Australian Vertical Working Surface heights can be determined using GPS and the latest release of the AGQG model. Um, and this gives heights above a smooth and flat surface in the Earth's gravity field. By using a, G a geoid model, uh, AVWS heights are compatible with GPS or modern positioning equipment in the first place, rather than trying to force a historic datum to be compatible with new technology like we've done with the AHD distortion layer in the OSGEOID 2020 model. These heights don't rely on any physical infrastructure like the AHD benchmarks, which can have moved or are disappearing in many places. Uh, they're referenced to a model, which isn't going anywhere. And AHD heights are really only defined on top of one of these benchmarks, whereas AVWS heights uh, are available anywhere in Australia and seamlessly on and offshore. In practice, what this release of AVWS looks like is we've made the AGQG geoid model publicly available in a variety of file formats, published all of the supporting documentation that details how to determine AVWS heights, and we're supporting their use with our online tools. So the AVWS is a, a modern height datum for modern positioning devices, and this is a first for Australia but it's certainly not internationally. The move away from leveling network-based height datums, which contain biases and distortions, towards geoid model-based height datums is becoming commonplace. Some particularly notable examples include the United States of America and New Zealand. So the North American vertical datum, 1988, is a, a leveling-based vertical datum like AHD. And as geoid models have improved, they're now seeing similar long wavelength differences between GPS and geoid model derived heights compared to the leveling derived heights at their benchmarks. Uh, you can see the difference between the leveling heights and geoid model heights there on the left. Uh, and as with AHD, uh, errors are bound to accumulate with such a vast network of leveling observations. Similarly, uh, until 2009, New Zealand had 13 local leveling-based vertical datums. Uh, each was referenced to separate tide gauge measurements of sea level. And this caused unknown offsets between them and made aligning height data between the separate zones challenging. So New Zealand first made the transition to a geoid model-based height datum more than a decade ago, with the introduction of the New Zealand vertical datum 2009. The New Zealand Vertical Datum 2016 is the, the latest vert official vertical datum for New Zealand and its offshore islands. And the geoid model, uh, NZ Geoid 2016, that underpins the datum is shown there on the right. In America, they have been releasing hybrid geoid models over the last five to 10 years, so a bit like OSGEOID 2020, but they're planning on transitioning to a gravity-only geoid model-based height datum soon. So you can see we're in really good company. This is the best model of the geoid over Australia that we currently have, and a map of its uh, accuracy or uncertainty. The uncertainties are the limit on how accurately heights can be determined using GPS in the model. So kind of the best case scenario if the GPS measurements on their own were completely error-free. The user requirement survey showed that uh, most of the people we surveyed needed heights accurate to five centimeters or better. And currently the uncertainty in our model is around the top end of this accuracy requirement. So to really deliver on that five centimeter accuracy requirement, we need to drive the model uncertainty down. As I mentioned, uh, geoid models are determined from measurements of the strength of gravity. And the accuracy of the geoid model is limited by how well the gravity signal is captured. In Australia, we have a, a fantastic national database of gravity measurements, which is hosted here at GA and maintained by the GAP section. Um, but it's not perfect for geoid modeling. To model the geoid at a single point, we need accurate and densely spaced gravity measurements over a wide region around the computation point. 
but the database that we have varies in spatial density. So here we've got a plot of the terrestrial or ground-based gravity data distribution over Victoria on the left, and the modeled geoid uncertainty or error on the right. The gravity field over the eastern Victoria Highlands in Victoria has a lot of variation, uh, mostly due to the ups and downs of the topography. But this topography also makes it very difficult to make dense measurements on the ground. You, d you just can't get in there with a gravity meter. So in this area, the gravity field is a, a bit undersampled at the moment, and this leads to up to eight centimeters of error in the geoid model over the region, which I've shown on the right there. The other consideration is the measurement error. So the terrestrial data are generally very high quality, but offshore, we have to use gravity values that are determined from satellite altimetry data. These are measurements of the sea surface made using satellites that are transformed into gravity values with a, a few math tricks. But these data are, are totally unreliable in the, the near shore zone, so shallow water areas. This is mostly because in these areas, the radar used by the satellite can reflect from the land or seabed rather than the sea surface. So uncertainty estimates of the gravity anomalies in these areas can be up to 100% of the signal, which are then carried onshore and cause large errors in the geoid model. So to demonstrate, left to right, here we've got a, a figure of the terrestrial data coverage over uh, a region around Greater Adelaide, uh, altimetry-derived gravity anomaly errors in the center, and the final geoid model error uh, over the region on the right. So the, the geoid model errors increase where the uh, onshore, where the terrestrial data thin, and right by the coast where the altimetry errors are large. So we have these kind of pockets of, of large errors in the, the, the geoid model. So to improve the geoid model, we need better and more consistent gravity coverage, particularly covering areas where the existing data are sparse or unreliable like over mountainous regions and uh, the coastal areas. And scalar airborne gravimetry, or measuring gravity from the vantage point of a plane, meets these requirements perfectly. Uh, effectively, a, a very accurate accelerometer is strapped to a plane, and the motion of the plane is removed from the accelerometer readings using GPS data. And what's left behind is gravity measurements. So with this method, we can measure any changes in the strength of gravity to the accuracy we need for geoid modeling. Plus, it's easy to get consistent coverage over otherwise inaccessible areas, so mountains and shallow coastal regions. It covers large areas very quickly and cheaply compared to terrestrial measurements, which are normally conducted on foot via helicopter and road vehicle. And we can cover the littoral zone easily, where there are large errors in the satellite altimetry and terrestrial or shipboard methods just aren't practical. In both of the examples I mentioned a moment ago, airborne gravity data has or is being used to improve uh, and regularize the existing terrestrial gravity data coverage onshore and cover the, the tricky littoral zone where other methods fall over, specifically to improve the geoid model. And this has been done in many other countries too, from Malaysia to Greenland and even Antarctica. So airborne gravimetry data over New Zealand were used to completely regularize the data coverage across the whole country, filling in holes in the terrestrial data coverage over areas of rough topography, particularly through the central South Island. And here's a map of all the individual flight paths on the right. Um, with these data, we were ultimately able to compute a geoid model that was accurate to around two to three centimeters. And in the United States, they are completing uh, the collection of a nationwide set of airborne gravity data with a similar intention of producing a more accurate geoid model uh, as a part of their gravity project. So to emulate the success of these projects and other, others like them around the world, in 2019, GA partnered with Oscope, the South Australian Department of Planning, Transport and Infrastructure the Surveyor General of Victoria within the Department of Lands, Planning and Water, uh, the Geological Survey of Victoria within the Department of Jobs, Precincts and Regions to collect uh, gravity data over regions in Victoria and South Australia. So I'd like to point out that the gravity data are 
really useful for geological and geophysical modeling, as well as for modeling the geoid. And in fact, until now, uh, this has been the main reason for collecting these kinds of data in Australia. And this is something we've been really mindful of when forming this collaboration. The data we plan to collect here will serve the dual purpose of being used to both improve the quasi-geoid model and to advance geophysical modeling over the areas and COVID-19 permitting, the surveys are being uh, beginning this year and follow more than 18 months of planning and preparation. So these are our two target regions, over Victoria on the left and South Australia on the right. In total, the survey area is around 150,000 square kilometres. The Victoria region has been split into three survey zones. The Greater Melbourne area, uh, Eastern Victoria 1 and Eastern Victoria 2. And we're capturing data with flight lines spaced every one kilometer over Greater Melbourne and Eastern Victoria 2, and with flight lines spacings of 500 meters over the Eastern Victoria 1 zone. For South Australia, shown on the right, the data are being collected along lines spaced every five kilometers. So these flight line spacings really speak to the resolution of the data we're capturing. We really need data which show features about five kilometers in size or smaller to make an appreciable improvement to the model. Also, it's kind of worth mentioning here that these are quite targeted surveys compared to the, uh, the survey in New Zealand uh, or that being undertaken in the United States. For now, we're just really focusing on improving the geoid model where the errors are particularly large where the existing data are sparse, and over major cities where the geoid model is kind of of most utility. Some airborne data have already been collected over the Gippsland Basin between our Greater Melbourne and EB2 regions, and I've used them as a, a sort of computational test bed. This area is shown blocked out in the figure on the left. And on the right are the gravity anomalies of the airborne data over the region. And this is sort of a map of the local variations in the gravity field, and they have a range of about 50 milligal. So we're looking at variations uh, in the gravity field of about 0.005%, so quite small. The data were collected in 2011 by Sanda Geophysics Limited on behalf of the state of Victoria, and they have one kilometer spaced flight lines with some infill down to 500 meters in the near shore region. These flight line spacings, these data should really blend well with the data we're collecting nearby. So the changes to the geoid model that are made by including these airborne data are shown there on the left, and they're quite small, just a couple of centimeters. And the error or uncertainty estimates of the geoid model enhanced with these data are shown on the right in meters. Over the area where the airborne data are available, we can see that the uncertainty map has been reduced from six to two centimeters. And this level of error in the model is much more closely aligned with our users' needs for five centimeter accurate positioning. Ultimately, we hope to reduce the uncertainty to a similar level over the whole region where the new airborne data are being collected. So over time, we'll be continuing to upgrade and improve the geoid model as new data become available so that users can determine better and better AVWS heights. But as I mentioned, the Australian vertical working surface is available for use right now, currently underpinned by the AGQG 2017 model. The uh, AGQG model and its error map are available for download through our GEOID <coughs> model Amazon Web Services S3 bucket. And GA's amazing flying hellfish team have put together a web app to allow anyone to convert GPS ellipsoidal heights to AVWS heights. And this can be used in conjunction with other tools like Ausgeoid, the Ausgeoid 2020 tool to convert AHD heights to AVWS heights too. I'd encourage anyone that is currently using an Ausgeoid model or AHD heights in their processing streams to consider the benefit of adopting AVWS heights. It's all right there and ready to use. AVWS heights have already been used for international initiatives, so most recently for the preliminary calculations to establish an international height reference frame. Uh, this initiative is basically to establish very accurate physical heights, or more precisely geopotential numbers, at a number of locations around the world. And it's a job that the Australian Height Datum Heights would be totally unsuitable for.
because they have features like that north-south tilt, which aren't consistent with how heights are determined everywhere else in the world. Whereas the Australian vertical working surface heights are better defined and more compatible with height systems used elsewhere. So for Australia's submission to the International Height Reference Frame, we used AVWS heights rather than AHD. So every now and then, as technology and methods improve, uh, datums are modernized to support better positioning. And here's a bit of a breakdown of the various datums that we currently support. New horizontal datums like ATRF, GDA 2020, and GDA 94 have been released a number of times over the last 50 years to improve accuracy, conform better with international standards, and recently to account for the motion of the Australian continent. But the vertical datum is well overdue for an upgrade. With ongoing improvements in GPS, the intrinsic accuracy of the Australian height datum is quickly becoming the limiting factor with respect to how accurately heights can be determined. The AVWS will position Australia better into the future. I'd like to finish by saying that we're not outright replacing AHD. AHD will remain the legal height datum and will continue to support the use of AHD heights. But we're providing and supporting the use of the Australian vertical working surface in addition to AHD for those that want heights that are more accurate, more physically meaningful, and specifically designed to be directly compatible with GPS devices in the first instance. Thanks for listening.